If Christmas time meant one thing to Gen X kids, it meant... Toys! Yes, toys! And during the late 70s and early 80s, some of the most least well-known but incredible action figures that were not Star Wars awaited us under the tree. You've entered the Gen Experience. I'm Victor, and after Star Wars changed the market forever with their exciting line of toys, suddenly action figures dominated Christmas. Over the next few years, the three and three quarter inch gold standard of action figure size was everywhere and populated Christmas catalogs and department store wish books right alongside the denizens of Star Wars. That is, until He-Man showed up and turned everything on its ear. These are a few of my favorite things. Well, at least when it came to lesser known action figure lines that we were still thrilled to get our hands on. So let's check out these Star Wars competitors and remember which ones we had and which ones we wanted. The first franchise to jump to light speed and get their new licensed action figures to market wasn't from the big screen, but the small, the sci-fi TV drama, Battlestar Galactica. The action figures did well to resemble the cast of characters, even without a drop of paint for face detailing. Even with the human characters looking a little like leg day wasn't so important in the future, the five points of articulation were just like the Star Wars figures and not difficult to manufacture, as Adama, Starbuck, a Cylon Centurion, and Daggett the robot dog played by a chimp, made it to the shelf in time for the debut of the show in fall of 1978. Mattel had the resources to appear in catalogs in time for that Christmas season. Sadly, Mattel felt with Barbie as their number one seller for girls, none of the female characters of the show would be created, whereas Athena and Cassiopeia would have been perfect selections. I was fortunate to have the entire first wave and still have two of these OG Galactica figures in my collection. Now, although it was a television show that would be first to follow up Star Wars with the new three and three quarter inch action figure craze, the movies weren't far behind. Disney was excited to pull off their first sci-fi movie, The Black Hole. The toy line debuted in 1979 to coincide with the Christmas release of the film, while Mego got the license. Mego was in top form when creating these well-crafted figures, from the detail on their uniforms to the additional articulation thanks to the O-ring construction technology that elevated them a step above the Star Wars figures. They had more posability. It also failed to give any recognition to the star-studded cast who they represented. The line had two waves and a number of figures, including the whole crew of the Palomino, including the only female in the cast, Kate McRae, and an important character to the story. The robots and the humanoids that existed on the Cygnus were also available and seen in these ads. With Ernest Borgnine, Anthony Perkins, and Maximilian Schell in this lofty space opera, the toy line was sure to do gangbusters. It had everything Star Wars had, except the return on the box office. The movie could not break free of its own black hole, and the toy line tanked. But not before millions of us got our hands on a Maximilian figure, and eagerly anticipated recreating the PG-rated death scene of Dr. Alex Durant at the blender-bladed hands of the vicious robot as he pureed Anthony Perkins. The most exciting moment of the movie, I might add. Oh, spoiler alert. Back on the tube, the year after Battlestar Galactica debuted and in time for the fall season, Buck Rogers and the 25th Century Toys debuted in stores and Christmas catalogs to fill our need to roleplay with our favorite out-of-time astronaut Buck Rogers and all his sexy adventures with future Mrs. Stratton, Aaron Gray as Captain Wilma Deering. The toy line was based on the original pilot movie, which did have a limited theatrical run in some places and even in other countries. All the heavyweights of the show were there, including two female action figures, Wilma and Princess Ardala. If there was concerns over selling the female characters in an inherently boys line, Mego wasn't phased. Everyone wanted the Wilma action figure, but probably after they had Buck and of course, Tweaky. Keeping the same construction as the Black Hole figures, Buck Rogers and his friends also incorporated the O-ring design for more articulation, which meant better posing, especially in vehicles and playsets made for the line. It seemed at least for a little while, it would be films who got the only five-point articulation and the TV licenses who took it up a notch with more posable designs. As is apparent when also in 1979, Star Trek The Motion Picture premiered. This big budget, big screen adaptation of a TV legend gave us the same action figure design still trending from Star Wars, who hadn't altered their successful strategy. Another holiday release, Mika was ready with their line that featured Kirk, McCoy, Spock, Scotty, Decker, and even Ilea. 
the first wave did respectable, even as the freshman film was met with mixed reviews. Even as Migo had made these with the common limited articulation, it was probably so that they were more easily assimilated with the Star Wars figures you already had for playability. Of course, that's completely sacrilegious for any Trekkie or Star Wars fan, and I should be punished just for suggesting that. Lucky for us, the main female character was released, which was important. Unfortunately, they also suffer from bland costumes that did not provide an eye-popping, catchy look for kids. Not to mention the movie was very cerebral and may have not resonated with young boys or girls. There was a second wave, and it looks like the random aliens that came out then were spared the birthing hips construction that plagued the look of the original Wave 1 characters. You'd think one of the biggest films of our lifetime, and one even produced by George Lucas, would have all the action figure preparation completed by the time of the film's release in 1981. But just like Indy, always a step behind his adversary Rene Belloc, Kenner did not release the Raiders of the Lost Ark toys until a year after the film's premiere, and two years before the second indie film, The Temple of Doom. With Kenner both Indy and Star Wars' toy company, I smell a conspiracy. But frankly, the line did moderately well and is highly sought after today. The toy line was fairly robust too, and like the last franchises mentioned, they also made the female character. Indy and Sala were joined by Marion, as well as the German mechanic, Tote the German officer, and more in two waves. Plus, there were three play sets, a truck, and an Arabian horse. As with other movie tie-ins, they too had the simple five points of articulation, but they also had an unusual design change from Star Wars. Not quite the hips that Kirk and the rest of the Enterprise crew endured, but large boxy crotches. Unlike Star Wars subtly squared off midsections, Indy and the gang had these wide, thick centers, or just very square laps. Perhaps it was better for riding that one horse. Before anyone screams that there were three and three quarter inch action figures before Star Wars, I know, the Fisher Price adventure people were some of my favorites, like the android male and female, the stunt cyclist, and especially the news crew. That afro is killing it. Oh, and she worked for Lou Grant. But those all blended in with other standard 1970s toys without much fanfare. It wasn't until licenses from movie and TV properties got thrown around, along with plenty of cash for marketing, did anyone take notice. Before Star Wars, they just came and went. After Star Wars, every manufacturer wanted to find the next intellectual property in hopes of striking gold. Back on the big screen, a mythological fantasy spectacle showcasing one of the last vestiges of the stop-motion animation technique in mainstream movies landed in theaters. Clash of the Titans is either a guilty pleasure or a cult classic. Either way, we all loved it. No matter how cheesy some of the creature motions may have been, it was epic. And the star power of Harry Hamlin, Burgess Meredith, Maggie Smith, and of course Sir Lawrence Olivier as Zeus gave it weight. But the toy line was very light in comparison. Only four action figures, and I had all of them. The four figures were joined by two larger beasts, one of Pegasus and the other the Kraken, the largest by far, and pretty impressive. The line should have been able to expand, and like many of its contemporaries, this was the first in some time not to include the female lead. Like Galactica three years before, Mattel still remained gun-shy about adding females to male-centric toys. Andromeda would have been a no-brainer, but Medusa, she would have rocked this toy line. Rock, get it? Like Medusa, stoned, you get it. But you also weren't going to get Calabosa's lair as seen here in this catalog sneak peek. Overall, the line looked great, and they got Hamlin's lips just right. The Dukes were a hit with the long run of the Action Adventure series and the success of action figures on toy shelves, they were a shoe in Mego seemed to have their business model down by 1980, and two waves of characters would cover all the bases. As Mego was never afraid to include the main female character, Daisy Duke joined the rest. However, the Bo and Luke figures were made with the O-ring design with lots more articulation, while the other characters, Boss Hog, Roscoe, Uncle Jesse, Cletus, and Cooter, even Daisy, were all five points of articulation. They didn't even seem to be cohesive in the same toy line, and yet there they were, with the General Lee, and, as seen in the catalogs, a Cooter mechanic station was going to be available, but it was canceled with the line. With so many action figure options on countless card backs hanging from the toy shelf pegs, did you have room for the Dukes? If so, you know you could have incorporated similar action figures from a totally different line to increase play value. 
I'm not sure of the extended play value offered by the 1981 action figures based on the crew of the Pacific Princess. The Love Boat's captain and all six of the original characters came on card backs in what was a very minimalistic toy line. Miko would eventually provide a Love Boat ship playset, but I'm not sure how many of those were picked up or if parents knew the intended audience and just left it on the shelf for future collectors. The figures looked the part, but they were not marked with any strong push. It just seemed Migo was looking for any IP it could acquire and get it out there. And Migo didn't even find this TV property worthy to give the more articulated O-Ring design. Wait, maybe they were secretly planning a shared TV universe. An MCU for small screen hour long action adventure shows. They had produced a Chips toy line that was pretty cool and one action figure for Mork and Mindy, but the less said about that, the better. If you were even remotely creative, you could find ways to incorporate Julie and Doc into other toy line play. And perhaps Isaac could work at the cantina in Star Wars whenever B. Arthur was off. These are well-known relics of the past, short-lived and not that exciting outside of a collector. The Love Boat line sailed away with not so much as streamers or confetti from a deck party. In 1982, a new player arrived, Tomy, and created unique crystalline action figures for a high concept, deeply religious allegory that perhaps moviegoers were not ready for, or it wasn't executed as well as it could. Either way, Tron is definitely part of our pop culture, past and present, and Disney hoped it would have done better. As a toy line adaptation of a film, they got the basic articulation, five points. However, in an ingenious gimmick, they were nearly transparent. Each character had a unique faded translucent color to them. That along with their thin line detail, light could pass through them and give them that digital frontier look that Flynn was so attracted to. Did I have these? No. But I do have some modern versions in my collection. Consisting only of Tron, Flynn, Sark, and a digital warrior, they were slightly taller, but still shy of four inches. The figures were unique, but it was simply the light cycles that everyone was attracted to. That wasn't enough to keep them going, and Yori the female could have been included if the line continued, but ticket sales for this masterpiece of technical wizardry closed the book on these figures. It seems like things were going strong in the toy licensing business, but the movie tie-ins were slowing down. For now. Finally, in 1982, by a toy company called TriStar International, of all things, a MASH toy line appeared. You can't get more action than patching up the wounded of the Korean War action figures. Less than a year before the dramedy was taken off the air after its 11 successful seasons, the toy line was complete with the main characters on the show at the time. To plus up the line, a blonde version of Hawkeye was made to portray random soldiers that came with the Jeep, the ambulance, and the helicopter. They were army builders before that became a thing in the toy collector arsenal. There was even a variant figure of Klinger in a dress. Talk about diverse. The figures have excellent face molds for the time, and like Kenner's Indiana Jones, they have very large lap or boxy crotch design that's fairly unique. And speaking of unique, there are small molding details and differences on each of the bucks that gives everyone a slightly more individuality. From Father Mulcahy's cross and cloth to Winchester's doctor's coat, there was even a full-on camp playset that was released that I've never seen anyone actually have. Do you know anybody who had it? If you did, let me know in the comments. It was 1982 and the landscape was going to change again. As movie inspired action figures were beginning to just slow down, move over three and three quarter inch, now there's something meatier. The Masters of the Universe toy line appeared officially in early 1982 and although Star Wars would continue what they started all the way through 1983 and Return of the Jedi, He-Man was soon joined by the likes of the Transformers, Thundercats, the real Ghostbusters, Brave Star, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, as well as other cartoon television series characters featuring larger sculpts and body bucks that He-Man benchmarked or bench pressed and led to the ultimate shoehorning of the three and three quarter inch figure off the shelf. However, and before everybody jumps on me in the comments about one of the most absolutely successful toy lines that debuted that year, G.I. Joe did return to toy shelves in 1982. They succeeded as three and three fourth inch action figures while many were disappearing and new lines were coming in at about five and a half inches tall. G.I. Joe achieved greatness with the O-ring design and even made the first real significant design update to that construction with swivel arms and full head articulation. Just as important, G.I. Joe was not licensed from a movie or a TV show. Although there would still be some movie and TV action figure toy lines like Dune and the A-Team that would join the 80s steroid craze and enlarge to five and a half inches, sadly, they just weren't that memorable. 
Most of the iconic properties rising in the ranks were created by the toy company themselves. All G.I. Joe figures, though, were based on the Marvel comic book. Yes, the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero was first a comic title. These new upstarts were just one of the many new characters, new toy lines, new action figures to debut in the early 80s. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're talking about those action figure toy lines that arrived between Star Wars release and before the arrival of He-Man. Which of these did you have and did you incorporate them all together in your play pattern? Was Clash of the Titans joining adventures with Galactica? Or did you do the unthinkable and mix your Star Trek and Star Wars characters together? Don't worry, I won't tell the Trekkies. Star Wars toys took the world by storm and Masters of the Universe was the most successful toy line once they arrived on the scene. Both extreme ends of the action figure design spectrum, it's fun to look back at that time between the two juggernauts the time when others tried their hand at action figures and media licensing. A time when toys that were not Star Wars or Masters of the Universe had an opportunity to inspire us with exciting possibilities. They were the toys we also wanted for Christmas. They were the toys we got and happily played with. They were the toys that came between Han Solo and He-Man. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this. A look at those toys we had during the Gen Experience. The ones that don't get a lot of love, but we loved having them. Speaking of love, I hope you get plenty of toy love this Christmas. And now, please show me a little love by clicking the like and the subscribe. And discuss your favorite action figures in the comments. Action figures are one of my favorite topics. Look around for more great content on the channel like this. And stay tuned for some other great holiday-centric shows. Until next time.